So now these are some of the classic ones where people think about mood stabilizers. It's interesting, you see how I put them down as, as anti-convulsants. Um, the, with Depakote, for example, they actually had a study that they were studying Depakote as an anti-seizure medicine. And when they were doing the study, you could have bipolar disorder and come into the study. That wasn't one of the, the excluding criteria. So apparently, I don't know why, but a bunch of people with bipolar got into the study. And you know what happened? All their bipolar symptoms got better on the Depakote. So that's somebody said, well, let's do some research on it. So that's how Depakote became used for bipolar disorder. Chance, okay? And then we did all this research and said, wow, it really works. Now the bad thing about that though is that Depakote works really good, okay? Tegretol and Triliptol, they work pretty okay. Gabapin, eh, not so much. Lamictal works pretty good for like bipolar depression. The problem is that when you get down with some of the stuff like even Keppra, you get some of these newer ones that come out and everybody's like, Depakote's an anticonvulsant, Keppra's an anticonvulsant, well, they must both work for bipolar, so let's put people on it, on the new ones. That's not always true, okay? Um, most people, if you put them on Depakote, they're probably gonna do fairly well. Um, if you put people on Keppra, I've seen a handful do really well in regards to bipolar, but not a ton. Does Keppra work well as an anticonvulsant if you have seizures? Yeah, it's great, okay? So you gotta really look at the different meds and see what's out there and whether it's kind of dated. Just because something's new doesn't mean it's gonna work or doesn't mean it's the best. And they actually just came out with one. Uh, do you remember the name of that Depakote one we were, last week we had? Sapris? No, not Sapris. Uh, maybe it is Sapris. It's actually, if anybody's seen the Depakote pills, you know how they're like these huge horse pills? They're these giant pills. Well, some company just came out with it, and they came out with one which is a gel pill, and it's 40% smaller than the old Depakote. So it's actually one of those you're probably going to start seeing that. I think it's Sapris because the drug rep just came by and because I said I need information on this before we start you know, using this prescribing it. It's, it's basically, it is Depakote in a different form and it's gonna be a lot easier for kids to take. So, um, so there's always kind of new things and you always wanna look and say, just because it's got a new brand name, look at the generic and see what's really in it. These are the same things, bipolar, mood regulation, aggression, explosive disorders, that's one of the other things. Intermittent explosive disorders or other disorders is that Depakote it's really good. I had a kid one time who, uh, he lived out in Bernie and he, he rode uh, bulls, you know, so he was a bull rider, that's what he wanted to do, and go to the rodeo. And he had bipolar, so when we treated him and we put him on the Depakote, it was just the funniest thing. I said, well, so what, how is it doing? What's it doing? He's like, instead of getting angry all the time, he's like, I've got eight seconds to think. And I sat there and then I was like, oh, I get it, eight seconds, because he's a bull rider. So to him, everything was in increments of eight seconds because that's how long he needed to stay on the bull. So he'd say, I can sit and focus for eight seconds before I would get mad. And in eight seconds, he's like, I calm myself down and then I don't get angry anymore. So I thought that's really kind of neat. That's a very good way of what some of the meds do is they help you stay in control. Okay, they're not controlling your behavior. They're helping you make better choices is what I try to tell the kids. I said, the meds don't make you better. You make yourself better. The meds are just there to help. Oh, uh, the other thing is that uh, a lot of these are metabolized by the liver, okay? Kids are pretty healthy, but if somebody has liver problems, you want to be careful using some of these meds with them. And they need frequent blood monitoring. <laughs> Side effects, sleepiness, tremors, weight gain. Um, with like Depakote, for example, I do not use that in my teenage girls. It can cause polycystic ovarian disease, okay? There's, it's, some people say it does, some people say it doesn't. Uh, you know, I don't want to risk that. Okay, so you really want to look at the person and what's going on with them. Um, if it's somebody who, let's say, has trichotillomania and they're pulling out their hair, you probably shouldn't use Depakote if they also have bipolar because Depakote can make your hair fall out. And if your hair is already sensitized to being pulled out, you know, then you may have more hair fall out and that's something they're already focused on. Okay, so you see you got to take the whole picture into account. Oh, and, and Lamictal and Tegretol can cause allergic reactions, which is very bad. If you see a rash on that, you want to stop it and call. Lithium is one of the other ones. Lithium's been around for forever. We, you know, we just don't use it as much anymore, but I've, there's some kids who it's like the best thing for them ever. But I also you gotta be careful because if you have a kid who's bipolar, like a teenage boy, and he's playing football and they're doing two days in 100 degree heat in Texas, it's not cool to say, hey, my lithium is on, I gotta go get some water, all right? And so you gotta be careful because they could get super dehydrated and that can make their level change. They could feel a little toxic or start getting side effects and then they'll drink like a ton of water and then that can dilute it out. So they're gonna be like, I feel like this med's not working. Well, it probably isn't because you gotta take into account their lifestyle a little bit too. Um, all right, let's move on. Let's go to antidepressants. Okay, so antidepressants, SSRIs are the classic ones. They work on serotonin, it's one we all think of. 
Um, personally, those those are my favorites. Okay, by, by far and away, I just like them. Um, and that I think that they're the safest, some of the safest, best meds that we have, and they're the most effective. You know, but they don't work for everybody. And so, if you look at the different ones, there's a little bit difference to each one of them. Okay, one is you have to think about. Um, how is it going to work with the person? Okay, if somebody's super anxious, Prozac and Zoloft, they work really well on anxiety, but they also can be a little activating. So if you start that one right away, they may actually get a little more anxious in the first like week or two. And if you have somebody who's already having panic attacks and you give them a medicine that makes them have more panic attacks, okay, then it's not going to work so well. They're not going to really trust you as much either because they're going to be like, you made me worse. So you have to figure out about the different meds, what works kind of for that person. Does anybody want to guess what the, the question that I ask before I choose which medicine? Want to guess the one question that, that I will always ask about, once I made the decision that we need to start an SSRI, actually most any medicine, what I ask the family? All right, he knows, I know. You're going to probably have to say it then. Is uh, anybody else in your family been on any of these that's been helpful? Mm -hmm. Has anybody else in your family been on any of these meds that have helped or not helped? Genetics is amazing. Okay, your environment is huge. I'm very much a behavioralist, but your genetics are amazing. And if you have somebody who comes in and you ask that question, they'll be like, well, you know, um, actually I'll tell you about a kid that I saw uh, recently. A kid came in and was having these horrible panic attacks and not wanting to go to school and just so nervous and anxious. And we we're like, okay, we go through it all. The dad was a pharmacist, which really helped, you know, and, and we were going through all the different things. And so the dad kind of knew a lot of the stuff. And so when I finally got to the question, I said, all right, we're, we're going to put you on something. And we just talked about them all. And they said, okay. I said, now my question is, has anybody in the family ever been on any of these meds? And has it helped? And all of a sudden, you see the mom and the dad starting to nod. And the mom's like, I've been on Paxil for 15 years, not had panic attacks. I'm doing great. She goes, I've tried to stop it periodically, and my symptoms come back. And so I looked at the boy. And even though they say, oh, don't ever start Paxil on kids, that's what I started. Three weeks later, the boy was like, this is better than I felt in years. Okay. Genetics are powerful. They're an amazing thing. So it's usually one of the easiest ways to say which med works. Or if you, on the flip side, I've had people will say, you know, parent, I took Zoloft and it just made me just super jittery and I couldn't sleep and had restless legs at night. Well, then you say, well, then I probably shouldn't start that on the kid because there's good chance that the genetics is going to make it not work. Um, so, but each of them are a little bit different. Paxil's more sedating. We don't, you know, it's, it, it was the one that kind of got implicated with the whole, you know, suicide precautions of black box warning and stuff like that. Um, the Prozac's a little more activating. It's been around the longest, it's kind of the workhorse of the group. It's also one of the $4 prescriptions. Zolt's $4 prescription, Paxil is, Selexa is. Lexapro and Selexa are actually variations of the same medicine. Selexa, there's a left and a right side to every molecule. So if you imagine it there, what they did with Lexapro, they pulled it apart. They kept the left side, which is the active side, got rid of the, the right side, which they're like, has more of the side effects. So then they created Lexapro. Okay. Now the difference is that Lexapro is great. It works very well, but they're not the same. Okay. Some people respond to one, but not the other. But depending on the family, Lexapro is still a brand name. They don't have a generic. So it's going to cost a lot more than Selexa would. So if the cost is an issue and that's going to keep somebody from care, do you see how you can kind of choose which ones to do? Now the other one, Luvox is in here too. And Luvox is, is in the class of the antidepressants and uh, that it's an SSRI. It, I personally don't think it works all that well with depression, but I think it's probably one of the best things ever for obsessive compulsive disorder. It is great, but nobody really uses it. And even though the name Luvox is there, they don't even make Luvox in the States anymore. You can't get it here, but you can get the generic, which is the fluvoxamine. Um, so you see how each one has a little bit of a different thing that it does. Some work better with anxiety, some work better with, you know, uh, depression, depending on the kinds of depression. So, so that's what you treat it for. And as you look, this is one of the ones I think on the main classes that when I talk about the, the things that it can do, because you look depression, anxiety, panic, obsessive compulsive, post-traumatic stress disorder, pain management, and the other thing is headaches, which is very interesting. What it does is you get people who can sometimes get these basal or migraines, and you can actually start them on things. I had a physician that I worked with. It was like, I just, you know, it was just OBGYN. He's like, I kept always getting these headaches. And I was like, you should try something. You should try something. He finally, you know, wore them down. And he was like, okay, I should try something. I said, like, try Zoloft and put it on there. And what it did is it took away these basal or migraines that he was having because it somehow reduced the stress level. Because think about it. Your migraines will come out with people when you start to get stressed. So somehow in its pathway, it lowered the stress level and it treated his migraines. Now, is it an anti-migraine medicine? 
Not at all. Okay. But you see how we were looking at the source as somebody who had a lot of stress, and that's what led to the migraines. Well, we reduced the stress, and the migraines weren't a problem. Make sense? Okay. So you always want to think through things kind of like that. You don't need lab work on these. Um, capsule tablets or suspensions. Um, there is a concern over increased suicide risk. Um, so you, that's something you always kind of want to ask them and, and talk to them. The recommendations, if you start somebody on these, the recommendation to counter the suicide risk that is there is just having contact like once a week for the first couple weeks saying, are you okay? It actually doesn't even have to be by the doctor. It doesn't have to be by a nurse. It could be even by parent. That could be most anybody. You just say, how are you doing? Okay. And that usually negates a lot of that because sometimes what happens is kids would get this and they start and they're like, this is gonna make me better. And then a week later, they're like, I'm still depressed. Because remember, these take three to four weeks to start working. So what it is, is it's, it's talking with them and, and uh, helping improve a lot of that. All right, uh, side effects, I put these on here. And the other thing about side effects is, I don't think I have it on this one. No, I don't on this one. Okay, so one of these I still have on there, I left it on there. The side effect of one of the medicines is influenza. Okay, and I don't know if you've ever found a medicine that actually causes the flu, but what happens is when you're doing a drug study, and let's say you're doing a six week time period, any symptom or side effect that that person gets they have to list it, and it, whether you can determine that it's from the medicine or not, it has to be put on there, okay? So if you get, let's say, let's say nausea, even though it can cause nausea, let's say nausea is there and you uh, are like, you know what, I'm nauseous every day anyways, because let's say somebody is, okay, this will sound bad because this shouldn't happen, but let's say somebody's pregnant and they're doing one of these drug studies, okay, which is bad, so I can't believe I'm using this example and they're nauseous every single morning, and they're taking a medicine, but let's say they're even taking the placebo or, or, or they're taking the active medicine, and they say, I'm nauseous, I'm nauseous. Well, then they'd say, well, that nausea is probably from the medicine, even though it could be from something else. Does that make sense? So when you see these side effects, that doesn't mean, I tell this families all the time, that doesn't mean you're gonna get every single side effect. We list them to be complete, so you can look and say, you know what, I have had dry mouth. Maybe it is from the medicine, then ask me. Okay. So most of these people will not get, it. especially with the SSRIs, that's why I like most people, you put them on there and very few people get side effects. But if you do, you wanna let me know, okay? Like I mentioned earlier, Zoloft with restless legs. Somebody's like, my head legs just shake constantly at night. And I'm like, well, it's probably from the Zoloft. Let's switch it to something else. And they usually do well. Okay, so other antidepressants. These other ones are all, the other ones work on serotonin and these others work on different ones. Um, they all kind of have various combinations, like Wolbutrin, for example, works on uh, norepinephrine and dopamine, okay, which also can help with uh, depression and anxiety. Effexor works with serotonin and norepinephrine, so they all kind of have different combinations. Okay. Does that make them better? No. It depends on what kind of depression you have. I have a feeling that someday they'll be able to take these symptom clusters and say you've got this symptom, this symptom, this symptom, this symptom, therefore all those go together and you should take this medicine because you're hitting the receptors that are causing that. That may be how it is someday. Right now, it's not that way. We use our clinical judgment we have to figure out. So once I ask the question, has anybody in your family been on something? And I get that answer, if they say no, then we try whatever it is that we, we see what's gonna help. Um, Deseril, for example, at the bottom, even though it's listed under the antidepressants, it's trazodone. You'll probably see it a lot with kids for sleep. Okay? Well, what happens is, is it used to be, if you're gonna use it for depression, you'd be using 300 milligrams or something like that. Well, it made people so sleepy that they couldn't take it. But they said, well, let's try it at lower doses for sleep. So even though it's counted as an antidepressant, we use it at a low dose for sleepiness. And it doesn't knock them out, it just helps them stop having that kind of ruminating, that thoughts going. But if you have a kid who takes trazodone and then sits there and plays video games, they're not gonna unwind and they're not gonna fall asleep. But if you take trazodone and you lay down in bed and you close your eyes, you actually, it helps you fall asleep, okay? So, you want to get lots of good history about what the whole, what's going on, like either bedtime routines and stuff like that. So what can they do? As you can see, same side effects, pretty much, everything pretty much has the same side effects. It's like you look at them all, they could all cause anything. Um, tricyclics, some of these are out there and, and it's so funny, we actually started this today on somebody, but this is one of those, you probably will never see tricyclics um, very much at all. They are, when I mentioned about the dirty drugs earlier, they're like the dirtiest. Okay, and these are the ones where 
if you use these for depression and anxiety and stuff like that, the worst overdoses and two deaths I saw of two teenage girls because they had overdosed on their parents' Elevil. Um, these are the ones that scare me. You have to check EKGs, They're, they have cardiac problems and they can actually, these can kill you. So you, if you have to use one of these, you'd be very careful. This girl that we had today had a lot of chronic pain and I'll tell you, I think the Elevil is probably one of the best medicines for chronic pain. It is wonderful. Um, and we had a girl who had a lot of like uh, physical complaints and physical symptoms. And so we're trying a low dose of this to see if it's gonna help some of that to make the mood better and the anxiety better. So if you use it, you wanna watch them closely. You'll still be, you know, you still use them, but you'll probably don't see them as much as maybe you used to. And then there's uh, Nardal and Parnate. You know, you always see on everything when you go to the pharmacy that says if you're taking MAOI, you know, don't use this or whatever. And everybody else says, am I taking that, I'm taking that? No, and these are the only two. So if you're taking those, be careful. And I think really in child psychiatry, I don't think we use very many of those at all. Um, those are the ones if you take this and you, you know, have certain uh, uh, cheeses right there, hopefully kids are not drinking wine, um, or even fava beans, you know, you, there's things like that or you give somebody NyQuil and, and uh, NyQuil can actually cause a serotonergic reaction that can make people very sick. So that's why we don't use these very much in kids, but I just wanted to have it on there for y'all to see. And part of me wants to see if anybody sees anything there. A little ink blot, to, if y'all see something bizarre in there. But I'm kidding, you don't have to say anything. So the anti-anxiety, we're just gonna go through these really fast because we've already talked about the SSRIs. Um, so when you look at other anxiety meds, uh, one of the things that is probably the safest, most effective thing for anxiety in pregnant women is Benadryl, okay? And, and so um, if you have somebody, and, and I mean, if it's safe enough to use in pregnancy, you know, it's a very safe medicine. So what happens when most people take Benadryl though? You got it, okay? And so you have to kind of balance that out. If you take Benadryl and you fall asleep and it knocks you out, well, you're not gonna be anxious anymore but it's kind of also not a good way to go through the day. Um, for me, if I take Benadryl, like if I have allergies and I take Benadryl, it doesn't make me sleepy. If my wife takes Benadryl, she's out. I mean, just, that's it, okay? So everybody's a little bit different. So if you give somebody some Benadryl and they're not having a whole lot of uh, sedation from it, you can actually increase that and use that as an anti-anxiety and it works very well. Like I said, for pregnant women, it's safe enough. You know, it's not gonna hurt the, the, the fetus and stuff. The other thing is Boost Bar, which is out there, and then Hydroxazine is another one that you can use in pregnancy. Boost Bar you don't use in pregnancy, but Hydroxazine you can. Um, hydroxazine is actually a very, it's like a cousin to the Benadryl. Um, if y'all have ever heard of Atarax, okay, which is used to be for like an you know, itch thing, it takes away the itchiness. So it really helps with anxiety too. So you can be like, if you have a rash and you have anxiety, you can use one medicine to take care of them both. Um, the others that you'll see down here, the benzodiazepines, okay, and what I teach my residents and students is to not use benzodiazepines in kids. I want them to never use them in kids. Do I use them in kids? Yeah, I use them in kids, but I just don't, I want it to be, I say don't ever use them because if you do need it and it's appropriate, I want you to think it through carefully, okay? If you have a kid who's having horrendous, horrendous panic attacks, okay? Um, and you say, well, let's start you on this SSRI, but it's gonna take four weeks for it to start working. The kid's like, I'm freaking out now. I'm having panic symptoms now. So what do you do? You say, well, you can use a two weeks of a benzo. The thing about these is they're addictive. Your brain and your body get used to these and they want them. And they're the ones that you start using it every day, you have to eventually increase the dose and then coming off of these is very tough, okay? They hit some of the same receptors in a way as like alcohol does. So if you start drinking a lot every day, it can cause that same thing. So they're very effective, they're very good things to use, but you just use them with caution, especially with kids. Do I use them with my teenagers? No, especially if it's somebody that I worry about some sort of abuse potential. I mean, I won't do it. Because like clonopin, I think goes anywhere from five to $10 in schools for one pill, okay? So if you give a kid a med, you wanna make sure that they're not selling it. 